We are on board the battleship New Jersey, and our interview guest is Dennis McDougall from ba uh, Beltsville, Maryland. Mr. McDougall served aboard the USS New Jersey during the Vietnam Commission from 1967 to 1968. Welcome home, Mr. McDougall. Thank you, Kelly. So we're going to start with some background questions. Um, what is your current age? Uh, I'm 70 years old. Um, when did you enlist? Uh, I enlisted uh, in uh, September of 1965. And how old were you when you joined the Navy? I was 17 years old. Okay. Um, what was your inspiration for joining the Navy? Uh, my family is all um, Navy men. My uncles, my father was CBs, and my brother uh, left high school in 10th grade and entered the Navy on the day he turned 17. He had to be signed in by my mother. And so I knew I was going to end up being drafted, so I didn't want to go to college. So I enlisted in the Navy, so I would at least have the choice of carrying on the family tradition. Great. Uh, where did you go for boot camp? I went to Great Lakes, Illinois. Uh, do you have any stories from that you'd like to share? Well, it was uh, during the big bulbs, the big push for Vietnam, and they had cut our training down to about half the time. Uh, we had about 12 weeks, and uh, there was a tremendous amount of people in there. It was, uh, a dip, it was dead of winter. It was very cold. Um, we didn't get to fire guns or learn how to handle guns. We had two-by-fours whittled to look like guns and with pieces of pipe on them painted black for guns to parade and march. Um, everybody that's Army, Marines, any other service can't believe that we never have handled guns. <laughs> and uh, it was a, uh, a hectic time. Um, I can't swim. I've never been able to swim in my whole life. And the only way I passed the swimming test was they had so many people in the pool that even with a dozen instructors, they didn't see me go to the bottom of the swimming pool and kick off. And that's how I passed the swimming test. And I realized I couldn't do that in the ocean. So for the rest of my Navy career, I always had three life jackets. One where I slept, one where I worked, and one near the chow hall. <laughs> Great. Um, did you go to A school? I went to Electrical Engineering A school up in Great Lakes. Okay. Um, do you have any stories you'd like to share about that? Um, A school... Yeah, I've got uh, two stories. Uh, I was, um, they had a cold snap in Great Lakes and the temperature dropped to minus 38 degrees on a Sunday. And a week later on Sunday, it was still minus 38 degrees. And Monday morning, they called me into the uh, captain's office and they wanted me to transfer and become an electronics technician. I was freezing. And if I stayed as an electrician, I would be out in two to three weeks. But if I became an electronics technician, I would have to stay there about another three to four months. So I told the Commodore, I said, sir, no sir, I'd rather be an exceptional electrician rather than just an excellent electronics technician. Okay. Um, I graduated uh, magna cum laude from electrical engineering school. The fellow that came in first in, in, in class was a three-year college uh, man that had uh, studied civil engineering and he took the top honors in the class. I struggled very hard with the math. We had two weeks of intensive math and uh, that was really hard for me. I'd stay up until three o'clock in the morning studying the math and uh, and then we we're up like five five thirty. They, they got us up, we gotta go. but. I, I managed to, um, to master the math, so. Great. Um, so what was the highest rank you achieved in the Navy? Uh, what was that again? The highest rank you achieved in the Navy? Uh, a second class petty officer, electrician's mate. Okay, great. Um, so now specific to the USS New Jersey, um, when you first found out uh, when did you first find out you were assigned to the USS New Jersey? My reaction was, what? <laughs> my wife had just come over to Scotland. 
I was supposed to be assigned to Scotland for the next two years. Um, it's hard to imagine this is a 1966, but Scotland and Britain were still recovering from World War II. There was no housing. Um, Scotland had got bombed intensely by the German Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe because of the shipyards. And there was still bombed out houses 25 years later when I'm in Scotland. There was no housing. The um, John F. Kennedy and the, the British Prime Minister had made a deal to put the uh, nuclear submarine base in Scotland. And part of the deal was the Navy would not build a base which is unheard of. Everybody, anywhere in the world, there's a Navy base where the Navy is. But their deal was we would be integrated into the community. Um, so there was no housing. You had to find housing among the public. All the school children had to go to Scottish school. There was no American schooling. It was a very unique situation in the entire U.S. Navy all over the world. Um, and we, had, I had managed to find a, a guy that his wife was going back to to America and, and managed to rent this house at the last minute and then here it is like three months later they tell me I'm gonna going back to America we did not have the money to fly my wife home and her parents have eight children they didn't have the money and my parents were poor and the Navy does not recognize a wife I was a third-class petty officer they recognized if I had a car they would ship my car home but they wouldn't ship my wife home. And so I managed to make second class petty officer and then the, rec the Navy recognizes you have a wife and they shipped her home at the last last minute. I, I, I got my promotion. Great. Um, uh, where were you when you first saw the USS New Jersey and what was your reaction to it? I was in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. It was night, it was raining. There's hoses and wires and junk everywhere. It was rusty, dusty, and busty. And uh, it was quite a sight. It, it, it was like, is this an auto wrecking yard or is this actually the Navy? Um, there's just, I can't, it's like if you've ever been to a fire when the firemen are there and there's hoses and trucks and everything. That's the way I saw the New Jersey the first time. And I can say, it's big. <laughs> it's a big ship. When it's sitting in dry dock, you get to see it all the way to 38 feet down in the water that this ship is sitting in. Um, it's, it's quite impressive, the propellers and everything. Okay. Um, are there any stories you'd like to share about your life on board? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a big ship. Uh, it's very difficult to find your way around. You basically, you learn how to get to where you have to work, you learn how to get to your battle stations, and you learn how to get to your bunk, and you learn how to get to the chow hall. And everything else is, is kind of superfluous. If you can find those four places, you're a pretty happy guy, because some guys couldn't. They had to get led back to their bunk. They couldn't find their bunks. I slept in a forward compartment up ahead of a uh, number one turret, and it was we re remodeled for Vietnam. We took all the 20, 20 millimeter guns off, all the 40 millimeters. They left us no any aircraft. Our protection was the aircraft carriers and the destroyers that, that went with us in the, in the group we were in. And we were strictly to have the 16 inch guns and the 5 inch guns. Uh, my quarters had been remodeled and they'd taken out a couple of the uh, bunks and these are the pipe racks with the chain with the, um, the uh, canvas with the rope and so we only had five bunks high and still it felt like there was like 18 inches between the bunks and uh, you didn't want to be the guy up on the fifth bunk if you had a tendency to roll out. It, it was a long way down to the, to the floor. Um, we, I was here for the, uh, I, I was on a pre-commissioning crew in engineering school and then I went the recommissioning crew, recommissioning crew, working with the yard people, getting it from what I told you what it was when I first saw it, getting it cleaned up, getting it ready to go out. We took it out 
the, the Delaware River. We took it out for shakedown cruises, test our power plants, and we also did what's called a structural test. And that's where they take and train those 16-inch guns. They train them around. They call it an over-shoulder the shot. They bring the barrels around as close to the ship as they can, and they fire them, and it tears the ship up. They, uh, they have to have all the windows down on the bridge. It will blow them out. And they had mounted new radars on the, for Vietnam. And they mounted big electrical box on the wall and had all the wires coming to it. And after we fired the guns, it looked like somebody put a hand grenade in that electrical box. There was nothing left with ripped off wires. The box was completely gone. The yard workers had these huge work boxes that the cranes would set on the deck. They were made out of half inch steel about eight foot like eight foot by eight foot plywood but it's steel half inch thick and they were welded and they would lift these things up they had air compressors in them the sand blasters and that concussion from that gun ripped the corner out of that box ripped that weld half inch steel and peeled it down like you opened up a sardine can about four feet and that's just the concussion um, after this happened and we came back, they got the blueprints out and they went to these 1938 blueprints and that's at the old-fashioned chemical made blueprints but handwritten in red with diagonal lines and beautiful printing it said mount no equipment here. And so they moved that electrical equipment for the new radar, they moved it over eight feet just beyond those red lines on the drawings and then the next time we shot the guns, it was okay. They knew way back in 1938 that you couldn't put anything there. When they did the remodel, nobody checked the blueprints. So yeah, yeah, that was uh, uh, my first experience with that. I was in I was in charge of uh, electrical generation and ship service switchboards in uh, number two engine room. And when they fired the guns, it was like a dust storm inside the ship. I mean dust came from everywhere. It shook the whole ship. Um, that was my first uh, oh, 16 inch guns fired. The next time we went out we did what they called firing for accuracy. We did it off the Virginia Capes and we had a uh, news helicopter there. We had you know people watching and so they're gonna fire for accuracy and they made me an observer and I was up on the 05 level and uh, Back then, I wasn't a big guy like I am now, so there's about 30 people up there, and they kept grabbing me and pushing me forward and forward, and I finally got up to the rail. I'm up at the rail there, and uh, no hearing protection back in those days, and I was remembering what it sounded like when I was down in the engine room, and it was a loud thump, and now here I am. There are the gun barrels uh, maybe 150 feet away from me, and I'm thinking, this is going to be really loud and I put my fingers in my ears and they fired the guns, all nine of them one time and the next thing I knew I was kind of on an angle I was over the rail and I was looking down five stories and I was dead and a fella took and reached his hand in the back of my pants and grabbed me by this this navy belt I'm still wearing and he pulled me back on the ship and my heart was going like this and I, and I turned around and I couldn't talk and I was and he looked he was a real old man he had to be 27 ancient guy and uh, I couldn't talk and he just went like this he looked me up and down and he says you got to hold on when they fired the big guns boy and uh, then he disappeared and my voice came back I didn't couldn't get his name we had a thousand four hundred and seventy guys on here and I looked for him for two weeks. The man saved my life. I don't know who it is to this day. So if you see this recording guy, give me a call. I owe you a cup of coffee, a beer, something. That's great. Wow. Um, so could you tell me a little bit about uh, your duty stations then? Your, um, about my what? Your duty stations? My duty stations? Yes. Uh, meaning on the New Jersey? Yes. Okay, well, at first I was in charge of the uh, number two engine room uh, mm -hmm. generators and electrical distribution. And then I was assigned to uh, after emergency diesel, and I took care of that. I was on damage control parties, mm -hmm. and uh, my battle station was the engine room, keeping the electricity going for the guns. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, great. Um, let's see. Uh, this may be a more sensitive topic, so feel free not to answer if you do if you don't want to. Um, but do you remember any of the political circumstances surrounding the recommissioning of the USS New Jersey? Yeah, we had a. Um uh, 20,000 people around the world wanted to come to the recommissioning of the battleship New Jersey. They only had room for 10,000 people. So half the people that wanted to be here in Philadelphia the day we recommissioned New Jersey couldn't be here. Martin Luther King got shot on Thursday. We recommissioned on Saturday. Philadelphia was under martial law. There was law against no more than seven people could congregate in one place. And here we had to get 10,000 people onto the Navy base safely. They had um, boats and uh, ships and canoes and kayaks out in the water. They had to take and put uh, cables across the uh, pier to keep these war protesters away from the New Jersey. Uh, some, some of these uh, boats broke through and they had this huge wreath like you see on the big department store in, in, in Philadelphia. It used to be called Wanamaker's. It's called Macy's now. It must be 12, 16 feet across and they were going to throw the reef up on the bow as a, as a measure of peace. And they didn't realize that the New Jersey bow is 55 feet in the air. How do you throw a 16 foot reef up 55 feet? They weren't successful. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was a wonderful occasion, yet it was a sad occasion. Um, on, you know, on, on a lot of points there, you know, with, with Martin Luther King and, and with the, um, the division of the country, you know, half the people being against it, and, and, uh, and as, as an enlisted man, you know, you got you to do it. You know, you're, you're under orders. You've signed a contract, a blank check with the Navy that says, uh, I'll do this up to and including my life. Okay. All right. Um, uh, did you ever meet Captain Snyder? Captain Snyder, yes. He was, uh, he was, uh, he was an interesting fellow. He was very easy to talk to. Uh, he was famous for wearing the, the New Jersey ball cap around the ship. He, he would uh, wear the ball cap and he would, get, he would get into everything. He would come into the engine rooms, he would go all over the place. And uh, my, my most memorable impression of Captain Snyder, I think, is in the next question, matter of fact, uh, he took and uh, we have these 40 millimeter quad mount uh, guns that were on the battleship that they cut off, but they left what was called the gun steel half inch thick walls that run around the, the, the guns. They're called splinter shields. So if, if a shell hits the ship close by, it'll hit that splinter shield and bounce off and not injure the guys inside. Served a second person, it was a huge racks on the inside of it, and that's where the bullets were loaded. They were lined up around the outside of this gun tub. And uh, no longer had the guns in them, so up on the I think it's the 01 or 02 level. There was two 40 mile gun tubs up there, which are no longer there. They've taken them off in the remodels from the 84, uh, 80s and 84. And uh, he painted those gun tubs baby blue inside so that they look like swimming pools. And the purpose was for the Russians flying over and taking pictures. He wanted to think of how great the Navy guys in, in the U.S. had it. <laughs> that we were so. Um, professional and excellent at our job that we had time to go swimming while we're fighting a war. Did you ever see anyone actually swimming in those or? What? Did you actually ever see anyone swimming in the pools or? They were, they were fake. Okay. They, they, uh, they still had the opening where you could walk out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a cutaway and to, to walk in and out and uh, they were just, you know, fake so that somebody coming over in a helicopter or a plane or whatever or, you know, even satellite taking pictures it would show up and uh, they stayed aboard the ship until um, Captain Robert Preston took over and that was one of the first things he did was repaint them navy gray it was on the uh, the battleship was going in for decommissioning up in uh, Washington and uh, Captain Preston made his midship cruise 
on the battleship New Jersey when he was up, a midshipman up at uh, Annapolis, and he's got a picture of himself and his wife standing at the number one turret. And then all these years later, that was like 1943, all these years later in 1968, uh, 69, here he is standing with his wife at the same spot. And it was very sad for him because this was his first ship, and he finally got to be captain of it, and then it, it wasn't a very long uh, command. He decommissioned the ship. How did you feel about when it was decommissioned? Uh, I was real busy at my next job. <laughs> um, I have, I've have, I have a unique, unique experience, I think, in the Navy is uh, of being part of the, being a plank owner of the battleship New Jersey. Uh, commissioning it, actually getting to work on it before it was recommissioned, and uh, when I left there, I was assigned to a uh, the, one of only two uh, nuclear missile carrying cargo ships there, World War II Victory cargo ships that were converted to carry fleet ballistic missiles to the submarine bases in Rota, Spain and uh, Holy Lock, Scotland. And so I was on that ship, and I decommissioned that ship. So I did a recommissioning and a decommissioning within about six months, eight months or something like that. I also managed to watch, I was an official observer for the firing of the 16-inch guns on a battleship near Jersey, and then when I was aboard the USS Alcor, I was an observer, official observer. We watched them fire the first, um, it's the Polaris A3 with the multiple warheads off of uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida. And uh, so I was an official observer. So I went, I saw Navy's most massive firepower from 1943 to 1968 within two months. From one era to the next, I saw the most powerful weapons that the Navy had. It's kind of neat. Um. You mentioned uh, moving on to the next job. Where, um, was that in the Navy or was this post? -Navy? Say that again. Um, what did after you left the battleship New Jersey? Oh. What else? Well, there yeah, when I left the battleship New Jersey, uh, I was assigned to the uh, USS Alcor AK-259, uh, World War II victory ship. It was one of two that it um, were fighting the Cold War with the Russians. Um, we we put the they put the fleet ballistic missile base over in Scotland, and um, you have you can't run the submarines all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to to uh, keep them working. It takes too much time. They want to keep them out there with the missiles as the deterrent. And so what they did was they put these forward bases there, and they took and converted these World War II cargo ships and they converted them to carry the missiles back and forth. Missiles don't like salt water. They're very, they're, they, they really don't like corrosion and things like that. And they, they'll, they'll throw hissy fits if you don't take care of them. So part of the, uh, the maintenance on a nuclear submarine is that they take a crane and they pull those missiles out of the submarine and they put fresh ones in. And then we take the ones that they've taken out and we bring them back to America. They go back and they, they completely overhaul them and get them ready again, and then you, you just keep the cycle, you just keep changing them out. And uh, so they first they started hauling them in the cargo hold, but they took and converted them and they put missile silos in our cargo hold so we could carry them just like they are on the submarine. And uh, it's very, very hot in these Navy ships. Uh, it's it's uh, always, it seems to always be over 100 degrees except when you get in Arctic places, and then it's usually about 32 degrees. But um, I, as an electrician, I roamed the whole ship, and uh, I went through the missile bay one day, and there's guys in there playing cards, and it's air conditioned. There was no air conditioning on ships back in the 60s. And uh, I'm like, why are you guys got air conditioning? Is that the captain doesn't even have air conditioning. And the guys are playing cards, and they said, you don't want to make these missiles mad. <laughs> that's why it's air conditioned down here. <laughs> and that's why they were in there playing cards, because it was nice and cool there, but yeah, the, the, the missiles were air conditioned, but everybody else wasn't. Um, we had, uh, I had an unfortunate experience in the in, in the Navy on that ship that uh, 
we lost the cooling fan, the main cooling fan for the engine room while we were tied up to the pier in South Carolina, but we were supposed to be heading for Spain. And the, the captain made the decision to go with only one cooling fan. A half hour later, we lost the other cooling fan. We've got no cooling. I'm standing watching the engine room. The temperature's up over 127 degrees. They've got, they're putting people on rotation, getting them out of there. They're giving them salt tablets. The doctor's coming through and giving them salt tablets. But as an electrician, all the electricians were up in the, in the, in the funnel trying to fix these cooling fans. So when it came time for my four hours to be off, I, I was finally relieved. I'm, I'm out of there. I'm already, I've already got what is either called heat stroke or heat prostration or something. I don't know it, of course, but I've got it. And I go up to the funnel, and you're up on catwalks looking down hundreds of feet. And uh, they, they said that, you know, that I had to work up there, and I couldn't. I was dizzy. I couldn't work. And they said, well, you have to go back down the engine room then and relieve that guy. So I had to go back down and, and spend another two or three hours down in that engine room. And uh, it, it gave me trouble. Okay. Um, are there any other stories you'd like to share about your time in the Navy? Oh, let's see. Anything that stands out particularly you want to share? I can say that uh, Scotland was a very, a very interesting place. It was a, a unique experience. Uh, in 1966, if you watch old American movies, and you watch movies about America in 1890, 1909, with the horse-drawn streetcars and stuff like that. Scotland didn't have bridges. They used paddle wheel steamboats to get back and forth across the rivers. When you got to the train, the train was a steam train. The trains that we quit in 1943, you know, except for freight trains, coal trains out of West Virginia because a steam train, steam engine is better to pull heavy vehicles than a diesel is. Um, so paddle wheel steamboats, steam trains, um, not very many bridges. It was a, it was like being in America 30, 40, 50 years before. It was a very unique experience. Uh, we got to go to uh, Edinburgh Castle. Um, turns out my family is from only about 50 miles away, but it would take two weeks to get there back in 1966 because there are no straight roads in Scotland. <laughs> And, and uh, 30 years later, I made a trip back with my wife and uh, uh, went to the Glasgow International Airport and we went around the country. We went to Oban, Scotland, which is where the McDougals are from. And we went all over and we ended up up in the north side of Scotland. Scotland's a small country. Um, from one side to the other, it's maybe 150 miles and north to south, it's maybe 300 and some miles. So, you know, it's like a state here in America. And um, to give you a, an idea from where I was, it would be like if you lived here in, in New Jersey and you decided to visit Denver, Colorado. That's about how the distance is going from Glasgow, Scotland, up to Aberdeen, which is the North Shore where they have the oil fields now. And I, I had a name of a friend from 30 years ago. And we got up to Aberdeen and... Uh, I went to this gas station to get directions and all of a sudden the place got mobbed and I just wanted to ask directions and there's two people and this is about Scottish people, they're very friendly. So I told the guy, I said, gee, I'll step aside, I just need to ask a question. He says, no, he says, you, okay. He says, you take care of these people, I'll take care of him. And he said, what do you want? And I said, I just need directions, I'm trying to find this, this house, I found this name in a, in, a, in a phone book. He says, all right then. And he goes and gets a map and opens it up and he sits there and he says, what's the address again? And I said, so and so. And he said, okay. And uh, then his eyes, he got scared. He went big eyed at me. And he's like, it's, it's 10 o'clock at night. You know, you, you can't get there now. The buses have stopped running. And, uh, and then um, he looked back at the map and then he looked back up and he says, have you a car? Um, I'm at a gas station. Maybe, yeah, I got a car. <laughs> it's all right then. And he starts giving me directions. I'm, my mind is working. I'm thinking, where am I going? Am I going into a bad neighborhood? Why was he so afraid? 
And uh, then he said, what was the other address? And so I gave him, and he says, that's only three blocks away. And I said, well, that's got to be his mother. It's him. I mean, he wouldn't live very far away from his mother, you know. And uh, the, the family stay close in Scotland. And so he gives me the direction. So my mind is still going. And I said, uh, I said, look, uh, you know, it's late at night. I said, uh, how far is this away? He says, ah, oh, it's five miles if it's a step. That's what he was worried about, that I had to walk in the dark all the way out to this five miles to find this house. And uh, so we got there very quick. Um, we got out of the car, and I don't really care what I look, look like. And I took off my, my hat, and I'm fussed with my hair a little bit. And, and my wife's like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to look American. It's the pubs have closed. I said, Scottish people are wonderful and friendly, but they don't tolerate drunks. And I said, if I don't watch it, I'm going to get the door slammed in my face. And so we go up to the door and we knock, and this lady opens the door, and I said, I'm looking for Jim Divers or his mom. And the door started closing. And I said, I'm a friend from 30 years ago. And the door stopped, she opened it back up, and she did the elevator eyes on me again. She says, well, I guess you are then, because I've been married to him for 25 years, and I don't know you. <laughs> and she says, she's opening the door up, and she says, Jim, you got a visitor. And uh, can I stand up? And, or am I going to lose the camera? Oh. Uh, okay, I won't, I'll, I'll be okay. Um, so, she, this fellow comes around the corner. And he's, he's standing, I'm sitting here in this interview, but he's standing, and he starts doing this, he's doing, he's going up and down, up and down on his legs, and my wife just loves me to tell this, because she's never seen a human being doing that before. The closest thing we know is a collie dog when he's happy to see you home. And he's going, and then we go in and we sit down with these people, and we talk to them until like one or two o'clock in the morning, just as if we saw each other two weeks ago. And he's talking to us, and he says, to, uh, he says, I heard the voice, and I recognized it, but I couldn't place the name. And my wife, on the way over there, asked me, how do I know this guy? And I didn't know. I, I, I couldn't remember why I knew him. And so I'm driving, and I said, I said he must have sisters. And, and my wife said, what? And she said, no, she said, why are you going to this guy? You don't even know why you're why you, uh, are, you know, how you met him or whatever. And I said, well, he must have sisters. So we're talking with these people, and I said to Jim, I, I tell him, I said, uh, you know, my wife wants to know, I said, do you have sisters, don't you? Ah, oh, you know I do, Margaret and Sheena. I said, see, I told you you had sisters. <laughs> That's how I know him. <laughs> and um, he asked my wife, he says, how long did it take us to get from the airport into Glasgow? And uh, she says, oh, I don't know. Uh, he drove a... Uh, 15 minutes, he says, yeah. He says, it's, it's, he said, it used to take two hours. He says, we didn't have any roads. He said, they did, we didn't have any roads. He says, now you can get there in 15 minutes because they put in roads, they call them motorways, but they're like our interstates. Um, he's talking to us, and he said, uh, he would put us up for the night. He said, I put you up for the night. He said, but you know, we just had, we just had my 25th anniversary. He says, and my aunt, she's up from the home place, which is down near Glasgow. It's in Paisley. And like I say, the difference from Denver, Colorado to Baltimore. And he's talking about that. And this, this builds into another story later. But anyway, um, I think, oh, he asked me how I found him. He says, well, how did you find me? I said, well, I went and the pubs were closed. You weren't there. I went to the police station, and you weren't there. They said they didn't have you. And so then I came here. <laughs> and uh, he was amazed that I found him. And I said, I had your mother's address from 30 years ago when she moved up here. <gasps> yeah. He says, you know, I didn't move up here with her then. I said, I know. But that's all I had on you. I figured I'd find her. Maybe I could find you. All right. I've, ta I've talked quite a while. So let me see. Um, uh, the last thing I got to tell you is, uh, we left. We had to go back to Glasgow, Scotland, to uh, catch our plane, and we went back. 
and I went over to his old home place, which is a place called Paisley, Scotland. And that's where they made the Paisley print. The girls love the scarves and all this, the blouses with this Paisley print. It's famous. And uh, I'm over there asking for directions to find people. And they said, you've got to go to the estate. What is a state here in America? It's a, where somebody rich lives, the DuPonts or somebody having a estate. Um, over there, it means a housing development. And sometimes it means a subsidized housing development. It's a low-income housing. And so they sent me out there, and I'm in this estate, and there's a fish and chips shop open, and this guy comes out, and I'm asking directions, and he jumps in my car with me, says, up the road, up the road with you, you know. And he up the road we go, and I'm doing about 20 miles an hour, and the guy throws the door open and jumps out. And I'm, I'm like, oh, my God, the guy just killed himself. And, it, and I stop the car, and he goes up the up this uh, house, throws the door open, walks in, and he says, and then the next guy walks back out, and he says, yeah, what, what do you need now? What is it you're, you're looking He says, he didn't know where it was, he said, but he knew what I knew, that's why he brought you here. <laughs> and so he gives me directions, and I go down, and there, I'm going to open this fence, and I'm knocking on this door, and I hear this noise, and there's this tremendous noise, if you've ever seen the cartoons where the big ugly dog with a spike collar and a huge anchor chain and he's dragging his dog house along, that's what it sounded like. And I ran back out of the thing and slammed the gate. And a guy comes around the corner and he's dragging a trash can. That was what that noise was. And so I, I say something to him and I asked him about whatever. And uh, I'm, telling, I'm telling him something. And I said, yeah, I just saw my friend up in... Uh, Aberdeen and everything and the guy says okay who put you up to this and I'm like what he says you know it's a very funny joke he says but uh, who put you up to this and I said I, I, I don't know what you're talking about I said you know my buddy's up there he just had his 25th anniversary I said his aunt was in the bed up he says oh my goodness you're telling the truth he says I worked with Jim Devers for 15 years <laughs> he worked with the guy and he thought I was pulling his leg and he takes me up the street to a dead-end court. And if you've ever seen the movie West Side Story, where they're up on the balcony, he goes there and he yells, Maddie! Oh, Maddie, are you up there? And this lady comes back out and she leans on the railing and says, you know, well, what is it, Pat? And he says, this fellow here, he's looking for a barrel boy. Don't the boys still live in the neighborhood? And, uh, and she says, yeah, they, they moved over by the school. And uh, so, but they're chattering back and forth, and I can't understand a word because they toss like machine guns. And so finally he says, yeah, he says, let me give you the directions. Sends me over there. I get over there to this, this uh, person's uh, sister's house. She opens the door to me, and she's giving me a, a fisheye look, and she gets on the phone and calls another sister, and she's looking at me and says, oh, no, he doesn't look like a bill collector. He looks all right. <laughs> And he said, okay, I'll tell him. And he said, well, she's working at the factory. So, so I left the message, you know. So that's, that's my, my uh, Scotland story. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, when did you leave the Navy? Um, I left sea duty in um, November of 68. And, uh, and I was discharged in uh, September of 71. Okay. Uh, did you have another career after leaving the Navy? Oh, I've had quite a few careers. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I worked for uh, Sperry Univac as a, uh, uh, a customer engineer, and I worked for, um, I worked in every, uh, the Navy, um, Navy Yard, Navy Annex, Pentagon, CIA, FBI, every initial of the federal government. Um, I've worked in Joint Chiefs of Staffs. Um, I left that career and I went and worked as a uh, machinist at the Washington Post newspaper, uh, a union machinist. Um, and I did that for another six years. And I, uh, I started my own companies in uh, 1973 when I was still working for UNIVAC. Uh, I got in trouble in the 70s, um, couldn't pay my bills, and um, 
I was going into my savings, $50 every month, and my wife has a, a background in bookkeeping, so she should ran some books on it. We found out if we quit going to McDonald's and we were a little more careful with how we bought gifts for people, we could, we could make it. And uh, we struggled with it, and then we finally realized, realized what was wrong. My mom and dad worked. My brother and his wife worked. All her brothers and sisters, the husbands and wife worked, and we were trying to live on one salary, and America was no longer a one salary country. Uh, the whole American dream, the American idea was that a man could work five days a week, eight hours a day, and support his family. And that dream went away. Um, you can't, you, you really struggle to try to live on one salary 40 hours a week. And I worked holidays, vacation days, weekends. I held his, uh, about the minimum amount of jobs I held was five, I mean two, and I, sometimes I had five. In the early 80s, I was working uh, two full-time jobs and running three companies. And uh, so I, I went on to own my own, own companies. When I had good jobs, family, family members and friends didn't. I was, I was always fortunate. I seemed to be able to get into a, a good paying job. Um, so I started these companies to employ my, uh, my family members and my wife's family members. And uh, over the years, I, I employed more than 20 family members and, um, and then friends of family members and then friends of my kids. And so I had about more than 80 people over the years working for my companies. Um, and then there was a, I don't know how to say this, it was a, uh, uh, the federal government had a problem with somebody out in California not cleaning machines that they made apple juice for children's food programs, breakfast in schools. And they already had in their legislature where they would, could fine them $156,000 or something, but they didn't do that. They went and drafted about another eight pages of rules, and they did that old famous thing called mixing apples with oranges. And my company dealt with fresh squeezed orange juice, and they passed these regulations that put uh, dozens of companies out of business all across the United States because of the rules that they passed supposedly to eliminate bacteria. That's what they ended up with was bacteria in apple juice. Um, the state of Florida got upset about it because if they sell the oranges, they had their scientists work on it and they found out that this bacteria cannot live in an orange, that the only way you can get the bacteria in an orange is to inject it in with a hypodermic needle, and then the only way to get it out is to incinerate the orange. And but it, uh, I was in the orange juice business for over 40 years and nobody ever gets sick on orange juice. It's like peanuts. If a peanut is bad and you stick it in your mouth and try to eat it, when you go to chew it, it automatically makes you spit it out. You can't swallow a bad peanut. And orange juice is the same way. If you would take, uh, I'll use the word rancid because that's what they use in peanuts. If you would take uh, bad orange juice in your mouth, you will immediately put it back out because you can't drink it. Um, so that kind of put my companies out of, out of business. And uh, I've been self-insured for over 30 years. And when you work for companies where you've got uh, medical insurance and eyeglass insurance and dental, you, you find out all of a sudden when you're on your own. And I, I had paid $10,000 a year for insurance and it basically only covered me or my kids if they got hit by a car or got leukemia. The good insurance was $25,000 a year, which I couldn't afford. So I, my wife tells me one day, she's trying to pay the insurance, she says, you know, we can't keep paying this insurance. You, one of us has to get a job. I happen to have the newspaper. And so I flipped it really quick, the classifieds. I said, okay, I got the classifieds. What is it that you want to do? Where do you want to go to work? <laughs> you said, one of us has to go to work. And so I ended up taking a job working for a, a, a flight, flight engineering company that does Goddard Space Flight down in Maryland. They do Goddard Space Flight Project. And my first assignment was working for the U.S. Navy. And I got to build, because of the changing Navy, 
they have these big machines on the Navy ships now that you take all the plastic water bottles and you put them in these machines and the machine takes and compresses them and melts them with 440 volt three phase electricity. It heats them up and it encapsulates this 22 inch diameter which is bigger than the, sh than the scuttles on this ship. 22 inch diameter hockey puck about that thick which ends up weighing about 30 pounds and they take and once they've got it melted and everything they put seawater in it and cool it and solidify it and you take it out and you stack it in a rack like you do CDs and when the ship gets back to port and then they can take that plastic and recycle it. When I was on in New Jersey we had these bricks delivered aboard the ship and I thought we were going to have a barbecue. You know, they were going to build a barbecue pit on the ship. They do that sometimes. They'll take oil drums and they'll cut them down and make a barbecue on it and you, they'll cook food and everything and then they just throw it over the side once they're done. You know, they don't keep it around. And so I thought they were going to make a barbecue, and then the guy says, no. He says, that's what we put in the garbage bags to weight it down. So they would use the big black garbage bags that you're used to seeing now. They already had them back then, and they would put bricks in it and then tie it up, and then they'd take it out to the end of the ship, and they'd drop it. I have this mental image of the bottom of the ocean with all these little black brick-shaped objects down there because the pressure down there just crushes all that stuff right around the brick. So there must be litter down there with this. I used to do that. We didn't have um, holding tanks for the sewage, for the dirty water. All this stuff has been added to the modern Navy. Everything just, when you came into port, they put it into a temporary storage tank. But when you went out to sea, it all just goes into the sea. Rachel Carson, do you hear us? Silent Spring. Great. Um, so to wrap up this interview, um, is this your first time back to the battleship New Jersey since you left? What was that? Is this the first time since I back came here? back? Um, well, we're we're from I'm I live down here in Washington D.C. and I'm a motorcyclist. I've been riding a motorcycle since 1963, and I would make uh, um, they call it Romeo. It's right, retired old men eating out. And uh, we would make trips. We would ride from down in Washington, D.C. We'd ride up here to South Philadelphia and go to Pat's or Gino's or sometimes Tony Luke's. And we would get uh, steak and cheese. And we would come over to the Philadelphia side of the river here and sit right there and watch the, the New Jersey here. And we did that a lot. And about four or five years ago, I was over here in New Jersey and I came here to the battleship, but there was no place for me to park on a motorcycle. Uh, the parking was way, way far away, and I was uh, disabled, and I, I couldn't make the really make the walk back then, and uh, so I wasn't able to come aboard. So this is my so I've I've seen it from the other side, and I've been here once before, but this is my first time back in 50 years. Oh well, a little less than 50 years, to when I left in '68. Uh, How does it feel to be back? It's neat. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot harder to get over the uh, waterproof door scuttles and, uh, and up and down the ladders. I don't know why. 50 years just seems to add something to you. Uh, the passageway, Broadway, that's so famous on this ship, it's one of the most famous parts on the ship because it's so big, it just seems a lot smaller now. I must have been littler. <laughs> okay, great. Um, are there any any last stories you'd like to share or tell? Oh, I think I've been pretty talkative. I, I've tried to uh, to to do a good job. Um, You've been doing great. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. Great. Then I'll just close the interview then. Um, so thank you for your service and taking the time to join us. Uh, this concludes our interview. This is Kelly Pickle, intern from the College of New Jersey, working with the Oral History Program on board the Battleship New Jersey in Camden, New Jersey. Today is Saturday, April 7, 2018. Our interviewed guest was Mr. McDougall from Beltsville, Maryland. This recording and any transcripts, abstracts, or indexes made from the recordings will be stored in the Oral History Department of the Battleship New Jersey 